Let's open our Bibles to Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, we find the account of Jesus being asked a question by his disciples. And I'm so grateful that they ask him that question. Basically, they say in the third verse, could you kind of tell us how we will know that we're at the end of the world? And Jesus proceeds onward in the 24th chapter to produce the longest of his teaching on the end times. And we're going to be reading verse 3 and 8 and 33 and 34 in just a little bit. But we already know from the last few weeks that a fourth of the Bible is prophetic. So I just want you, before we read this, to to just kind of survey how vast a field prophecy really is. Just by looking at, and this week I examined, the numbers, just the raw numbers of how much God has revealed for us. So uh, just just sit back, and, and what I'm going to come to, I'll tell you the conclusion before this, that everything I'm going to say, if you took it all and laid it out and sorted all these verses and put them in piles, kind of like sometimes we have to do with our receipts or with something, you, know, you, you or your laundry or whatever, you put them in piles. If you've put all these verses I'm going to talk about in piles, basically they say this, that between now And when all of us are eternally in God's presence, God has seven succeeding events left on his plan for the earth. Now, now, theologians have differing views on exactly the sequence within those, but basically there are seven what I like to call big events on God's calendar. So, first of all, we start out that, that we have one Bible, okay? One book, the Bible is the book that God wrote. That one book has two parts. We know the Old and the New Testament, 39 chapters, 27 chapters, uh, the Old Covenant, the New Covenant, basic two parts. These two parts have 66 individual books, and those books total, in all of them added together, 31,103 verses. So in your mind, there's just over 30,000 verses in the Bible. If we took just the verses that talk about prophetic things, just the ones I say, the the prophetic verses, they come out to 8,352 verses of the Bible that talk about the future as they were written. Now remember, uh, the first prophecy, remember Enoch said, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all the ungodly and all their ungodly deeds. That was probably the first prophecy in the Bible, Enoch, the seventh from Adam. But that's just an example of a future event that he prophesied, and that would be one of those prophetic verses. But all of those verses, about 6,312 of them, have already happened. So of the prophetic verses, 8,352, 6,312 have already happened. For example, God promised Abraham, that that he would have a son. That was a a promise, and and he said that that son would would have uh, succeeding generations and that they would become the children of Israel and that they would just multiply. And Remember all that? That already happened, just like it said. And and many other things, like God told Moses to tell the children of Israel that if they lapsed into idolatry, he would cause them to be carried away. That was a prophecy that, that Moses made, and that has happened. We call that the exile. But just to repeat, 6,312 verses have been fulfilled, and if you put those in, in sorted them, there are about 522 different events that God predicted, and there are quite a few verses describing each of those. One of those is the coming of Christ. There are over 300 verses just predicting the, the coming of Jesus Christ to be born, to be the Savior of the world. And so that's an example of how you can have one event with many verses. But that leaves 2,040 verses in the Bible that God says are going to happen in the future. 2,040 specific predictive verses that are still in the Bible. And if we took those and sorted those, those 2,000 verses... That's where we get what is called modern-day biblical prophecy. Now, now you say, this is an immense amount of material. Yes, it is. It takes Some people, it's taken their entire lifetime. In fact, uh, the person I, I most read when I come to the whole eschatological flow and, and the divisions of the Bible is a guy from a generation ago. His name is J. Barton Payne, P-A-Y-N-E. And he spent his whole life, this is what he did his whole life. He just codified, studied, sorted, charted all the, now I'm not talking about charts of, you know, the beast and the ten toes and all this, but I'm talking about charts of the raw verses of the Bible. 
and putting them in categories about Israel and about the church and about uh, the Antichrist and about all these things. He spent his life doing it. And basically what he said, and and I've spent quite a few hours examining, I agree with him. He said that there are, out of these 2,040 verses, these all come together to predict 215 different facets about Christ's return to the earth. So, so he narrowed them down to 215 specific predictions from God about the end of the world. All of those events, by the way, right now are in the process of being fulfilled. But let me narrow it down even more. Each of the 215 events that lie ahead for this planet are part of one of these seven big overarching events. You, you know what the seven are. This is nothing new. It's, it's the rapture, the judgment seat of Christ, the tribulation, the second coming, the millennium, the great white throne. You know these, these events. These are not new. But I want you to think of them in terms of the vastness of the number of verses, 2040, that describe all of these events that are coming. This evening, this whole grouping of verses I like to call just a simple what's next because all of us if we believe what God says these events are going to happen God has told us what is next for this planet and so I hope that that it as as I describe these events these huge events that that I hope that it it just solidifies in your mind but the the goal is not for us to be walking in Bible encyclopedias about prophecy Always in the New Testament, when prophecy was talked about, it did not cause division. It did not cause camps to form, that I am an ah, and I'm a pre, and I'm a post, and I'm a mid, and I'm a I don't know. It didn't do that. It was totally different. Do you know what it did to all the people? It solidified them in the longing for Jesus Christ to come back. And, and a little bit later, when we start tracking through these verses, I'll show you one of the, the uh, specific events in the church in Thessalonica. So the Bible all those numbers aside, has many specific events that God says, he categorically says, these signal the end of days for life on planet Earth as it has been for the last several thousand years of recorded history. And each of these prophetic signs that Jesus Christ and his apostles and prophets gave are specific. They're not vague. We're not talking about going to be tough times ahead. We're talking about specific, these, these verses say specific events are going to take place in specific parts of the planet. Okay, let's see Jesus explaining this in Matthew 24, starting in verse 3. Jesus said that these events would begin at the same time, they would run concurrently, and they would crescendo. Jesus uses the illustration of the woman giving birth. The closer we get to the second coming, he said it would be like the the contractions and, and the birth pangs of a woman getting stronger and closer together. And all of you who have tracked with your wife through the birth of a child, to some degree you've experienced the, you know, the doctor saying, well, how close together are they and how much, and, you know, and, and, and you just notice that they get stronger and closer until finally the birth takes place. That's what the second coming is like. Jesus describes this. Now, when we get to Matthew 24 and verse 3, this is phenomenal. You're listening to an exact recording. You understand? Through the Bible, you're getting to hear Jesus Christ explaining this to the disciples. I I hope that the Bible just comes alive to you in a new way, that you're actually listening to an exact recording of what Jesus said, sitting on the side of the Mount of Olives, looking at the city of Jerusalem, with his disciples gathered around him. What a wonderful thought to think we can hear his voice through his word. Well, let's read 24, 3, 8, 33. Follow along in your Bibles with me, please, and let me read. This is what Jesus says in verse 3. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, and here's their question. I'm so glad they asked. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So obviously Jesus had talked about enough that they knew something was happening. Skip down to verse 8. Jesus starts describing them, and in verse 8 he says, All these are the beginning of sorrows, or birth pangs. And then slip down to verse 33. Jesus said this, and, and you can read all the rest, but I just want you to get the highlights. Verse 33, So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. 
And then he says, heaven and earth pass away, but my word will never pass away. Luke's addition, his, his also record of this, adds a couple more words. He says, the generation that sees these things begin to happen. Jesus, Matthew says all these things, and Luke says, and Jesus said, he said all these things beginning to happen. It's an amazing thought for us who, I believe, if you carefully look at this, are the first generation ever to live on this planet where all the things Jesus talked about are all happening concurrently right now in our world. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for letting us hear Christ's voice, letting us have this perfect, exact, marvelous, supernatural record of that event. And I pray that it would spur us to be like the early church was, excited about your coming, wanting to be ready, wanting to have our lamps all trimmed and bright, wanting us to be expectant, saying, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. At any moment you could come, at any moment you could call, we want to be found ready for you. Stir our hearts, for that is truly the anticipation that should be reflected in the Lord's Supper Because you told us that we eat this bread and drink this cup until you come. Until you allow us to drink it new with you in your kingdom. We long for your coming. Teach us more of that tonight. Open our eyes to behold wonderful things, we pray. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. The list of biblical signs of Christ's return will not actually be full-blown until the tribulation. So I just want you to understand that these things will not be going cataclysmic until that that seven-year period of the time of Jacob's troubles. But each of the signs of Christ's return, he said, are trends. Jesus described this as when you see them begin to happen. So they have a beginning and they start amplifying and, and going toward a crescendo. Each of these trends we see speeding up in the tribulation. They get faster and faster. The last seconds of the countdown clock of Christ's return are clicking down because as these, these trends begin, as they're all in place, then at the moment that Christ decides, he said it's an hour known only to the Father, he is going to launch this and the whole process is going to take place. Now exactly where he pulls us out of the world in this process, as I said last time, there's nothing specifically that says in the Bible that Russia will not invade Israel while the church is on the earth. It, there is no, there's no um, uh, specific timetable for that Iranian-Russian invasion. So it, there are some things that we just are just expectant. We don't know when they're going to happen. But each day, this, this picture that Christ painted, it's getting clearer. In fact, if you read some of the old, like Matthew Henry, the, the great Bible teacher of, of centuries ago, when he looked at this, he, he tried to see this in the monarchy of England. He tried to see this in some of Europe, but he couldn't. And if you look at, at succeeding generations or even previous generations to him, uh, as I said, Luther and Calvin both looked at these passages and they just couldn't see it. Uh, they thought it was in the past, maybe the Roman emperors or something, but they just couldn't see it. But each of these signs were captured by the apostles and prophets between 2,000 and 3,500 years ago. Remember, uh, 2,000 years ago, Jesus said these words, and Matthew and Luke and Mark wrote them down. But they were quoting what was spoken earlier by the major and minor prophets and even all the way back to Moses. So all of these signs, as it were, were captured between... 20 and 35 centuries ago. But the amazing thing is, now they're happening in our lifetime, what they talked about. We are the first and the only generation to see all of this happen. In all of history, only our generation has seen every one of these events starting to unfold. All of them, yet to be completed prophecies, fit within not only the seven major events, the rapture, the judgment seat of Christ, the tribulation, the second coming of Christ, the millennium, and the great white throne, and eternity. Not only do they fit within that, but also Jesus described them in a broader sense than just these big events we know about, these signposts. He also described what I like to call the the signpost or the signs of these trends. And so, before I go through the seven major events, and I'm going to actually have you tonight, if you've never done this, 
Mark them in your Bible. Mark in your Bible where it talks about the rapture. Mark in your Bible where it talks about the judgment seat of Christ. And, and actually, if you're a Bible marker, you should have a pen. And I actually write these at the top uh, in the margins of my Bible so that every time I come through there, I go, oh, yeah, that's right. That's where that one is. That's where you describe the millennium's described or the great white throne or whatever. So that all of us, we should be able to, on our own with just a Bible, defend what we believe. And that's, that's what's so important, and that's, that's a part of our responsibility. But before I survey the, those big events and, and help you get them clearly in your mind, I want to share with you the, the signs, the signposts, these trends, the ones I say that, that we're the first generation to experience them. Here, and, and by the way, this is just my list. There are different ways that you can look at this, but this is just my list, and I'll, I'll read them off to you, what Jesus described. Number one, Jesus talked about a time of global travel, and, and that's a trend. And, and there's always been people traveling on the planet, but we are in a time, and when I explain this one to you, uh, in just the, the last hundred years, we have seen exponential growth in travel, going from basically the same way people traveled for the last many thousand years up to unbelievable mass travel at high speed. So global travel is a sign of the end. Secondly, the global explosion of knowledge. I was just reviewing today uh, the capacity of our computers. You know, and we've gone so fast past mega to giga to tera to peta, and now we're beyond that to the exa and, and beyond. You know, there, there are uh, those little acron- or these little um, prefixes you're going to hear more and more about. In fact, the Wall Street Journal recently talked about the, the exa flow, that this whole idea that there's so much stuff on YouTube and MySpace and Facebook and all these places that if everybody starts beaming all of their movies and pictures around, it's going to totally overwhelm the internet because there is such a vast body of information out there that's now measured in, in exabytes, which is, is millions of gigabytes. And, and it's, just, it's just numbers that are just hard to, so many zeros you can't do it. But there's an explosion of knowledge, and the Bible predicted that. It also, Jesus talked about globally seeing the weather going wild, going crazy. And I remember one of the first weather events that the whole world took note of was the great quake and tsunami of 04. That was a global event. Everybody tuned into it. And everybody, it was the first time that a major disaster was watched all over the world. Now, I know the terrorists, but, but that wasn't a weather-related, the 911. This was a weather event, an earthquake followed by that tsunami that swept across and killed 200,000 people in just seconds. That event became a global weather gone wild event. Uh, That was uh, witnessed by another one of the trends Christ talked about, global telecommunication and television. He describes a time when people are going to be talking to each other around the world and when they all, the whole world, sees events like we did the, the weather events. The whole world is going to start seeing things together. I mean, the Olympics recently was a global event. Uh, it, th- this whole stock uh, meltdown. I don't know if you read the New York Times today, and they said that we were 500 trades away from a complete loss of the, st- the stock market was going to go down to 7,000 something, and it would have caused just the Great Depression too. And it says we were 500 trades away from that when the government halted all that. And, and the whole world was watching that breathlessly because they have so much of our money and, and everything else. But that's global telecommunication and television is one of these trends. Another one, Jesus said in Matthew 24 that the gospel is going to go into the whole planet. Global evangelism? There's never been global evangelism. We've tried and tried and tried, but they didn't even know how big the world was. In the time of Christ, they didn't know where all the tribes were. They didn't know about all of the Stone Age tribes that were scattered all over the place. They, some of these were in inland areas that, that were not known until this century. And, and it wasn't until the advent of flyover with airplanes and satellite positioning and satellite mapping that we really realized how much of the surface of the earth there was. And in the wake of all that came the possibility through the telecommunication system that our world has developed to actually get the gospel across every square inch of this planet. Jesus said the gospel was going to be preached everywhere on the planet before he returns. And that's one of the trends, that there's going to be a global evangelism going on in the background. And that was not possible until our generation. There weren't enough people, and there weren't enough maps, and there wasn't enough knowledge of where all these different people groups were. Uh, the, the sixth trend is global pestilence. As Jesus talks about a fact that, that the beasts of the earth are going to, and these plagues are going to be killing 
huge numbers of people. If you read Revelation, you know, it keeps saying, you know, a fourth and a third and a quarter and all this. And it just talks about these massive amounts of people, global pestilences, kind of like the Black Death of the 14th century, only around the world. And now scientists are starting to talk about that, the HN51 virus, the, they call it bird flu, that is, a, is very similar to the 1918 Spanish flu that killed hundreds of thousands and millions of people. I mean, they made mass graves. In fact, that's how they're getting the strain and the DNA from it, because they buried people up in Alaska in the permafrost. And those people have been like in, on ice all that time, and they're going up there in the military bases and extracting the bodies are still there. They're extracting the DNA and they're finding that what killed millions in 1918, the same type of disease is now replicating and going through and transmitting around the poultry farms and the pig farms of, of China and the Southeast Asia. And as soon as that thing makes the jump to humans, now every so often we get a little blip, somebody dies in Vietnam and in Indonesia, a couple here and a dozen there. But it hasn't yet made the jump massively like the Spanish flu did in 1918. But unsafe people are saying we're coming to the verge of another global epidemic, a killing millions type of flu that's going to spread. And the Lord talked about that. That's the sign of global pestilences. And then there's the... What I've mentioned several times, the, the seventh trend, is this digitalization of money. Remember, you can't buy or sell in the tribulation without the number. Now, we're all worried about, you know, what it is. But we miss the fact it's a number, that money is reduced to a digit, to digitalization of money. Up until our modern times, it was always commodity-based, that you traded oil and wine for grain and, and lumber for this and gold for that. Now, the is it $62 trillion of derivatives that are out there and, and uh, CDOs and all this stuff that the whole thing is wiping out Lehman Brothers and everybody else? All this, there's not that much cash around. Those are all numbers, digits, that have been built up in our wealth system that is digitalized. And the Bible says that's exactly how the end of the world is, that money will be digitalized. And the eighth is weapons of mass destruction. Jesus said that if he did not stop this, no flesh would be left, that, that we would kill off each other. That was never possible until our generation. From 1945 on, it was the first time in the history of the planet that everyone could be killed with human means, with the advent of what we call weapons of mass destruction. And then the ninth one is the, the sign of the return of the wandering Jews, the promised land. And not just that, it says that, that they were going to have walls. The Bible specifically says in, in Ezekiel that they are going to have, they're going to be hiding behind walls. And it says that in the, the tribulation that the Antichrist comes and he causes them to, to not, that they, they come to a place of unwalled villages. You know what's really significant about that? Everyone always said that just meant, you know, that's a euphemism for old fashioned gated villages. Really? How come the whole world is now focusing on this security wall that Israel's building, the length of their country, and, and the whole world wants them to take it down? And they say, we're not going to take it down until this charismatic European leader or, or revived Roman Empire leader says, we'll defend you if you take your wall down. And then you're going to see Israel dwelling in an unwalled way, which could be what Ezekiel was talking about. Prophecy is always clearer after it takes place than before, but it could be that. But definitely their return, possibly behind that wall. And finally, the last sign and trend is the sign, the growing global apostasy and demonism. Uh, remember, Paul said that in the last days, people would give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, and that the church would grow cold, and that apostasy, the falling away from the once and for all delivered to the saints' faith, would take place. It's happening all around us. I mean, we have, it's just so quickly, the, the advent of the backing away from solid doctrine. We have everything going on today, interfaith communions, where, where stuff goes on between uh, you know, American, Native Americans and, and Hindus and Buddhists, and they just bring all this stuff in it, and they do it in a church with an altar and a cross, and they put a Buddha next to it. They just kind of say, hey, let's all... Have you seen the bumper sticker that has all the symbols? You know, it has the cross and, and the menorah and Islam and everything. It's, come on, let's just all coexist. That's what apostasy is all about. You just reduce everything down 
Like the letter I got when I pastored in New England, it was from the local council of churches, and they said, because you pastor a large church, you're going to be asked to speak and pray at public functions. And if you do, please remember this. The one thing you mustn't do is name the name C-H-R-I-S-T in conjunction with J-E-S-U-S, because that is very offensive. And if you want to be good with the ministerial association, never put near each other Jesus and Christ, unless you're swearing, and then it's okay to do that. But don't in prayers ever conjoin or, or put beside each other Jesus and Christ, because that is offensive. That was from the Protestant Ministerial Association of Rhode Island. That's what apostasy is all about. You don't offend anyone except God. And that's what apostasy is. Well, those are the, the trends. The series of, of, of growing trends that are that are increasing in their intensity and what you're going to see is the closer we get to the end each of these that this whole i believe what's going on right now in wall street is a convergence to get a global economy and a global somebody's going to say hey let's just let's fix this money mess let's just have why do we have yen and euros and everything let's just have one and we won't be all mixed up and be having all this change in our pockets we can't use i mean it's just coming i don't know how soon but there's going to be some global way of buying and selling that is going to be part of how the antichrist can stop people from buying or selling but let's let's begin by going to revelation 22 and i want to show you the seven big events before we get all mired into these trends the these signs i want to show you the big things what i call seven steps from now to eternity and these seven steps are heaven that's the final the seventh and then the great white throne is just before that. The millennium is just before that. The second coming is just before that. The tribulation is just before that. The judgment seat of Christ is just before that. And the rapture is first. So I want to back through these with you, starting in Revelation uh, chapter 21 and verse 1. And then we'll read a little bit in 22 and verse 5. And basically, heaven is God's ultimate goal, to, to have us there forever worshiping him. And when I think of heaven, I, I think as a believer, and by the way, I want to apply each one of these. When you think of heaven, be investing. Okay, heaven is all about investing. Jesus said, when he talked about the future, he said, lay up your treasures where? Okay, that's what we should think about. In fact, you should think, do you have anything there yet? Have you started your automatic direct deposits in heaven? Remember how to do that. Jesus said that what he measures is what you give that costs you something. Remember what Jesus profiled about the widow with her two mites is now how much she gave. And now what she gave it to. It, she just gave it to the Lord. She gave it in the court of the women probably in one of those receptacles and it went for a specific relief. But the key was she gave it to God and it cost her something. And that's what God measures. And the way you do your direct deposit in heaven is it's not the amount it's the price that it costs to us. The price of our time, the price of our life poured in, the price of our resources that we give. How much it costs us is what is important to God. But let's be investing and in laying up treasures in heaven. And you can start with me in Revelation 21. You just follow along, and I'm going to read to you uh, the first seven verses of 21 and the first five verses of 22. And I want you to just think about heaven, and I just have a big... Uh, I highlighted with a big yellow highlighter, this is heaven. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And by the way, the word, there are two words for new in the Bible. There's new of a different kind and new of the same kind. And this is new of the same kind. Heaven is not going to have blue grass, green skies, pink water. Okay, it's not like that. God is making it all new of the same kind. That means you're going to recognize in heaven the same features that we were used to here of plants and, and of the, the sky and, and of what the water looks like. So it's new of the same kind heaven and new of the same kind earth. For the first heaven, the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? How Jewish everything is. We have a book that's written by Jewish apostles and prophets. We're going to a Jewish city called Jerusalem. Uh, we have Jesus, who is the son of David. Uh, I mean, there's such a Jewishness about it. And, and the gates and the foundations are merging of the, of the New Testament apostles and the Old Testament tribes. And there is the gathering together of the old and the new people of God in this new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God 
prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle, the tent, the dwelling place of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write these words, for they are faithful and true. And he said to me, it is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. And he who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And slip over to chapter 22, 1 through 5. And he showed me a pure river of the water of life. You notice how all of a sudden it's like the Garden of Eden again. We're in paradise. Paradise restored. Paradise as it it shall be forever. Clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and from the Lamb, in the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. Now be careful this idea that time shall be no more. There is going to be a sequence of time in heaven. You notice the tree of life is bearing fruit every what? Yeah, it's not like it's a blur in heaven. We're just all sitting on the cloud and, you know, you just lose track of time. There's going to be a sequence. So I don't know how the Lord's going to do it, but it says every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there will be no more curse. But the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. That's our occupation in heaven. And they shall see his face. Interesting, in the New Testament, it says in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? See God. So only the pure-hearted servants are there. That's a picture of the redeemed. We're his servants, we serve God, and we see his face. And his name shall be on their foreheads, and there shall be no night there. And they need no lamp or light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Heaven. And we should be investing. Now back up to chapter 20, and we're going to back up the whole evening. We, sixthly, that's the seventh step between now and and eternity, and that's heaven. The sixth step, the one just before that, is a great white throne. And that starts in verse 11. And we should be faithful to point people to Christ. Why? Because people are going to go to hell, not because they didn't hear about Jesus, but because they're sinners. And so we should be telling them about the remedy to sin. Don't worry about the, the fact that, 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 you know, these people, they say, oh, what about the people who've never heard of Jesus? The bigger problem is they are sinners. And the only solution to sin is hearing about Jesus. But don't get caught up on the pygmies who've never heard of Jesus. Jesus already has told us about that. In, in Psalm 19, he said, there's no tongue or language where my voice is not heard. Romans 1, it says, he has lighted uh, everyone who's come into the world with that candle of conscience and with that candle of creation. And Jesus said, he is the light that lights everyone that comes into the world. So God's doing his end. We're supposed to do our part, sharing the good news of how you do something with the SIN virus we're all infected with doesn't matter where you live, you are infected with the SIN virus, and it's terminal, and there's only one way to solve it, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. But look what happens to those who die in their sin, and we should be faithful pointing people to Christ, and this is their doom if they do not come. Verse 11 of chapter 20, and I have written in my Bible, great white throne, be faithful, point people to Christ. Then I saw a great white throne, him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. In other words, they couldn't hide. Verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. You know, it was interesting in reading all the giga, terra, peta, exo, whatever, zeta, and jubileo, whatever those other ones are. You know what they said? They said all the recorded words that have ever been spoken by all people throughout all the history of the world could be summed up in 25, I don't know, exos or something. That's how much capacity would take in a computer. You know what? They're actually thinking that they could record everything everyone said. I thought that was fascinating because God has. And what's interesting is he's erased the recordings of all who come to Christ. Because there's no recorded sin against any of us in this room tonight who have embraced Jesus Christ. He has deleted that forever. And it's not like, you know, 
the spy systems, you can recreate someone's hard drive and find out their secrets. God says the blood of Jesus Christ means there's no condemnation to anyone who's in Christ. No record of the sin, no penalty due on that sin. All of that sin is on Christ in the record Jesus erased. But for these unfortunate lost people who never embraced Christ, everything they did is written in the books. Verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. See, the reason they go to hell is because they're sinners. It doesn't say anything about that, you know, that they didn't come to church or anything else. They died in their sins. Now, yes, only Christ is the solution to sins. But remember, everyone is guilty because they're a sinner. And when we go out, that we must engage people with the fact that, that whether they like to admit or not, they are sinners. Big and little sinners, but sinners. And sinners are going to come to the great white throne unless their sins are removed. Verse 14, then death and Hades were cast in a lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life, the eternal registry of those redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It's one of the most sobering moments in the Bible. They appear one by one before God. The angel points out, and God, however he does it, plays it on the screen, this is your life, shows their sin. And then they're cast. This word speaks of actually a literal throwing into a lake, a bottomless lake of fire. The great white throne teaches us we should be faithful and point people to Christ. If you look at the first 10 verses of the 20th chapter, uh, this might be as far as we get tonight, the fifth event. Seven, heaven, six, the great white throne, five, the millennium. I, when I think of the millennium, the first 10 verses, and by the way, there's a huge amount of those 2,040 verses that are about the millennium. The millennium is an amazing time when Jesus Christ literally rules on earth from Jerusalem, and the whole planet is under this amazing... Uh, uh, God reigning over them. And in fact, it, the, the details in Isaiah are amazing. If you don't come to the, the temple for the feast during the millennium, God won't rain on, he won't allow it to rain on your fields. <laughs> a couple years of that, ooh, you come to the feast. You know, you don't want to, because a lot of the people in the millennium are not believers. In fact, the majority of them are not believers, but they outwardly conform. You know what it teaches me, the millennium? You can have a perfect environment and still have rotten people. That would have saved America billions of dollars. You know, this whole great society thing where we tried to knock all the buildings down and build new ones so everyone would get nicer to each other? No, no. No, a good surrounding does not make good people. You have to have an internal transformation, a heart transplant. So when I think of the millennium, I think be focused. Christ is the one that's going to perfect the earth. I don't have to clean up. I mean, I don't throw trash in the ground, dump my oil in the river, but also I'm not trying to save the earth because it's not savable. Christ is going to fix it. In the millennium, he's going to make it all new, and he's going to make it perfect, and it's going to be wonderful. I don't have to focus my life on trying to perfect the earth. But look at the millennium. Uh, For those of you from a background that always wondered about this, verse 1 of chapter 20, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit. Remember, uh, hell was created for the devil and his angels, and the devil is in this waiting room called the bottomless pit, and a great chain was in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon... That serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. And right there you see that the, the serpent of the Garden of Eden uh, and all, you know, the devil that tempted Christ, this is all the same person. This is Lucifer, the son of the morning. He lays a hold of him, and look what it says. He bound him for a thousand years, and he cast him in the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they that sat him, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness in Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or the image and had not received the mark. And these lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, and the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. And you notice the constant repetition of the words that I repeated real loudly? Yeah, thousand years. That's where millennium comes from. It, it's, it's over and over repeated that this is a specific, numerically uh, numerated period of time, that it is a thousand years. That's where millennium comes from. 
And this is one of the most talked about parts of the Bible. And yet there's a whole group of born again Christians who are called ah millennialists. They say there is no millennium, even though that there are hundreds of verses describing it. And even though it says over and over that it's a thousand years, God said, I am going to take the devil. I'm going to chain him up. I'm going to put him in a pit and I'm going to do this for a thousand years. Did I mention that I'm going to do it for a thousand years? Did I mention that everybody's going to live for a thousand years? And after a while you wonder, what does he mean if he doesn't mean a thousand years? Do you know what the amillennials say? They say the devil's chained now. Really? Long chain, right? He's pretty loose right now. I'm not sure what's going on. But not to make fun, but I mean, the best interpretation of the Bible is to take it for what the people that heard it thought it meant at that moment, the first canon interpretation. And if someone heard thousand years, thousand years, thousand years, thousand years, and thousand years, you know what they would probably think this was? A thousand years, yeah, because that's what God said. And then verse 8, he's released after, the, or 7, after the thousand years has expired, Satan will be released from his prison. So he's literally, he's not in there now, he's going to be put in there. After he does havoc on the earth during the tribulation, he is confined to that place, that pit, for a thousand years. But then he's released after the thousand years. In verse 8, he goes out to deceive the nations which are on the four corners of the earth. And like I talked about last week, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. And they went up from the breadth of the earth. They surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven. There's no war. There's no confrontation. God just says, this is enough. You know, just any incinerates them all and then resurrects them and they stand as you read onward. You say, how do we get unsaved people in the millennium? Well, think about this, that the people that begin the millennium are, the remember the sheep and the goats? The people that survive the tribulation, human beings that survive because God stops it and there are believers and they are called the sheep and they are brought in and they begin the peopling of the millennium. And so those people that survived seem to all be believers, and they all start in the millennium. But you know what? They have children, and they continue. In fact, it says in Isaiah that if you die at the age of 100 during the millennium, you're considered a mere child. It appears that everybody lives for the whole thousand years because it's a perfect earth, perfect food, no pollution, no microwave, no cell phones giving you cancer, no smoking you know, and inhaling all that. It's all perfect, so you're living a thousand years But each generation has to make a choice. And believing parents have children, and they have children, and what we find is that God has no grandchildren. You're either a son or daughter. You're not a grandchild. You're not saved because your parents are, or vice versa. And each succeeding generation gets further away. They hear about it, but they don't respond until finally the majority of the people on the planet, as it says here, from the breadth of the earth, they come and surround, and God incinerates them. That's the end of the millennium. And we go into the great white throne, which we've already covered. What does the millennium say? We should be focused. What does the great white throne say? We should be faithful. What does heaven say? We should be invested.